Hello, thank you so much for coming back to the channel. Well, today we're going to learn from the prophetic layer of scripture, studying out of 1 Samuel, Hannah's prayer for a son. Because it is the prayer that our father wants the bride already praying for the left behind church. So look at 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 11. This is Hannah, who is barren, the wife of Elkanah, faithful, loving groom. He loves her the most, and she is desperate for children. And she gets to the point where she's so desperate that she makes a vow to God. And this is a powerful prayer that God answers. And we can look to this prayer and begin praying for it now because we know God will answer our prayer as well. So Hannah, she made a vow and said to God, O Lord of hosts, and that's important, who she's praying to. She knows God has armies. O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. And now listen, this is very important. Of all the things she could have said, she says this next, and a razor shall never come to his head. All right. We know that she is dedicating her son that God gives her as a Nazarite. She's already placing on him the Nazarite vow. Now, the Nazarite vow includes numerous um, things to it. There's various things they need to abstain from. One of them is that a razor shall never come to his head. So we want to understand why does Hannah single this out? Why, when she's desperate and she's praying at the tabernacle in Shiloh and she is so desperate now for a son, she says, all right, I don't want him just for me, just to raise a beautiful child and enjoy motherhood. No, I'm so desperate. I'm going to dedicate him to you. I'm going to give him to you, and he's going to be a Nazarite. But what's interesting here, she singles out, a razor shall never come to his head. So this is what God is wanting us to study. Now, she's asking for a child. She, in this passage, is the pre-trib raptured bride. And now she wants children. Well, as we've learned here, there are numerous names for the left behind church that are recorded in scripture. And when you know there's a pre-trib rapture of the bride, a mid-trib rapture of the church, they go up, get glorified bodies, and then there's a post-trib sideways rapture of the remnant, we get to see all kinds of things emerging from the scriptures, and this is one of them. So we also learn, once you know this, that God uses other terms for the church, but he uses them for the left behind church because once the bride is taken out, once the rib is taken out, that changes the DNA of the church. So the church gets a new name. Matthew 9.15, Mark 2.19, Luke 5.34 in the King James Version is called the group, the church that's left behind, the children of the bride chamber. In the NASB, it refers to them as attendants of the bridegroom. Now, the NIV really massacres it, uh, calls it the guests of the bridegroom. And I don't know how they get that um, phrase from the original manuscript, because when you study Strong's children of the bride chamber, the word children comes from G5207, and bride chamber is G5367. We learn that from this prophetic layer that Hannah is the bride and she is praying for children. She's, for us, it means we're going to be praying for the left behind church. We want children. We want to see our sleepy loved ones that are Christians, they're saved, but they're just not interested in the word. 
They're so uninterested in the Word, you can't really even hold a spiritual conversation with them about the Word because they don't know enough of the Word to have a conversation. The Father is looking for a bride that can have a conversation with the groom about Scripture and continue learning about the plans of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, how they work together, how they fulfill prophecy together, how the bride is involved in that. All right, so now, Hannah says, a razor shall never come on his head. All right, we need to figure this out. What, what does that mean? Well, we know that hair is symbolic of power and authority. Let's take a look at David's son Absalom, for example. And let's talk about his inheritance of power and authority. He was the king's son. He began using in oh, 2 Samuel, he began using his power and authority that was inherited um, from his father, King David, and he began using it in an unrighteous way. And it ends up, you know the record, he gets caught in an oak tree by his hair, the hair on his head, and when he tried to usurp his father's throne and take over the kingdom. And so as he's hanging there by his hair, his power and authority in an oak tree, he is then killed with a spear. So we get a really good example of power and authority and how it can be good for us or we can misuse the power and authority that God gives us and that will harm us. Let's take a look at also Samson, his hair, because this is, you know, building the foundation of why Hannah vowed to God that he would be, Samuel would be her son, would be a Nazarite, but specifically no razor would cut his hair. We learn in Judges chapter 13, verse 5, that God had promised Samson's parents, Behold, you shall conceive and give birth to a son, and no razor shall come upon his head, for the boy shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Okay, so we understand that Samson had incredible power and authority. He became a judge in Israel, and he began to deliver Israel from the hands of the Philistines, and it was through his, the power and authority represented and demonstrated through that gorgeous head of hair he had. So it says here in Judges chapter 16, verse 17, this is verified, he told his wife, so he told her all that was in his heart and said to her, A razor has never come on my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaved, then my strength will leave me, and I will become weak and be like any other man. Now, we see that God has a razor and he is going to cut the hair on the head of the remnant. Listen to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 20. In that day, the Lord will shave with a razor, hired from the regions beyond the Euphrates, that is, with the king of Assyria. Oh, so God is going to use the king of Assyria as a tool. He's going to hire him to do a job for him. It goes on to say, the head and the hair of the legs, and it will also remove the beard. What's going on here? Well, God is going to humble the remnant, those who miss the mid-trib rapture of the church. They're called the remnant. They will finally be humbled through experiences. Their power and authority is going to be removed and they will begin calling on the name of the Lord and they will get saved. For the prophetic layer, for our application, she's praying that her son will be the church. She's already the raptured bride, pre-trib raptured bride. Now she's praying, give me children. I will dedicate them to you. They will have your power and authority. No razor will touch their head. 
and they will be the church. So Hannah's son, our children that we're praying for, are going to be conceived by the Holy Spirit after we are raptured and we're spending time with Christ as one, the church becomes our children of the bride chamber. We're praying for them now by faith. We're praying that they are dedicated to God. We're praying that no razor will touch their head. And the church is going to begin once they are raptured at mid-trib, they are going to begin to deliver the remnant of Israel and the remnant of the Gentiles from the hands of the Philistines. So how will the church do this? Oh. Psalm chapter 2, verse 9. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. So this is a prophecy of the Messiah, of Jesus. But once the church is raptured, the church is going to work as one. Our children of the bride chamber are going to work as one to destroy the power of the enemy during the second half of the tribulation. They're going to start working to preserve the remnant because the remnant will have a powerful ministry during the millennial reign. Okay, let's go on to learn about the rod of iron. Revelation chapter 2, verse 27, that is the letter written to the left behind church of Thyatira. And here's the promised reward if the left behind church will heed it. Revelation 2, 27, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I also have received authority from my father. So not only is Jesus the rod of iron, but the left behind church, as they receive this promise and they of this reward and they heed it and they become overcomers, they will become also a rod of iron working as one with Christ. So that's a reward because salvation is free, rewards are earned. The rapture is a reward. The pre-trib rapture is a reward. The mid-trib rapture is a re reward. The post-trib rapture that goes sideways, even that's a reward for faithfulness and dedication. Okay, now we're going to see the fulfillment of that promise to the left behind church. And this fulfillment is in Revelation 12, 5. And she gave birth to a son, a man child. Oh, we just learned another term for the left behind church, the man child. So she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. All right, so the church is going to be raptured at mid-trib. They are called the man-child. They are going to be a rod of iron. They are going to work as one with Christ to begin setting the remnant free from God's enemies, the Philistines. <laughs> so we want to be praying like Hannah that God gives us these children children of the bride chamber. We are praying before our rapture by faith. We're already praying for our, our loved ones who may be left behind. And just like God answered Hannah's prayer and gave her Samuel, the prophet, and the hair of his head was never cut. A razor was never taken to his head. Can you imagine how long his hair must have been by the time he passed away? Okay, so as the bride, we are praying and prophesying Hannah's prayer over the church and over our sleepy loved ones. They might be family members, they might be neighbors, co-workers, other church friends that you know are Christians. They're just not 
too interested in the word right now. They might be great humanitarians. They might be serving tirelessly in the church, but they're just not interested in the word who is Jesus. Pray that they become dedicated in, in their understanding of Christ, that they learn Bible prophecy. Because as we study Christ's resurrected body, what does Jesus do? First day out of the tomb, he teaches Bible prophecy. So that's what we will be doing when, as the bride, when we step into our resurrected and raptured body at pre-trib. I want to really wrap this up right now and encourage you to be praying like we here are as the bride. It's a beautiful reward to be raptured at pre-trib and we are we have that blessed hope. We don't have wishful thinking. We have the blessed hope that we're going to be that pre-trib raptured bride. And so by faith, we are already praying for our loved ones, for the sleepy church, for those who are not yet saved that we love dearly. And we're praying that after we are raptured pre-trib, like Hannah, give me a child, give me a son, give me many sons, give me children of the bride chamber, give me the man child, all right? And God will answer our prayers just like he answered Hannah's prayers. He will raise up Samuel's, he will raise up Samson's from the loved ones we are praying for. All right, now again, this is all by faith, but see, this faith is what is pleasing our Father so much, and it is showing Him that we are preparing ourselves for to be the helpmate of Jesus Christ. We want to be a skilled helpmate. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this lesson. I hope it cleared up some things for you and showed you a prophetic layer of scriptures that you have not maybe noticed before, and we'll talk to you later. Bye!